Greetings, dear church, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Today, as we have an opportunity once again to turn our attention to the Word of God, we will be studying the Epistle of Philippians as we have been going through word by word, chapter by chapter, been looking at what Apostle Paul teaches. We went through the second chapter and we saw how he gave the example of Timothy and Epaphroditus, the two great young men that served, that gave everything for, for the service of the Lord. They gave everything. They did not count. They did not hold anything back for the service of the Lord. And then we get to the third chapter, and here we see the clearest explanation of the gospel, what the gospel is and what it isn't in these verses that we'll read today. We'll be looking at Philippians chapter 3, verses 1 through 11. This section, as we will read it, I would like us to focus on three uh, uh, word that repeats three times is the word count. Count. How to make your life count for Jesus. As we go in verse 7 and 8, the word count repeats a few, uh, few times, and we'll see how this word is the most important word in understanding this whole passage that we'll be reading. So the title of my message is How to Make Your Life Count for Jesus. Let's read these verses together. Philippians 3, 1. Finally, my brethren, rejoice in the Lord. For me to write the same thing to you is not tedious, but for you it is safe. Beware of dogs, beware of evil workers, beware of the mutilation. For we are the circumcision who worship God in spirit, rejoice in Christ Jesus and have no confidence in the flesh. Though I also might have confidence in the flesh, if anyone else thinks he may have confidence in the flesh, I more so. Circumcised on the eighth day, of the stock of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of the Hebrews, concerning the law of Pharisee, concerning zeal, persecuting the church, concerning righteousness, which is in the law, blameless. But what things were gained to me, these things I have counted loss for Christ. Yet, indeed, I also count all things lost for the excellence of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom, I, for whom I have suffered loss of all things, and count them as rubbish, that I may gain Christ, and be found in him not having my own righteousness, which is from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ Jesus, the righteousness which is from God by faith, that I may have, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection, and the fellowship of his sufferings being conformed to his death, if by any means I may attain to the resurrection of the dead. So we read a fairly large passage, and we won't focus on the entire scope of this uh, many verse, 11 verses that we read, we'll focus primarily on what the Apostle Paul means. What is the gospel here? He's saying, I count it all loss for the, for the cause of Christ. So how we can make our life count for God. And we see as we start verse 1, we see he says, finally, my brethren. So he's kind of bringing um, as, as, almost as bring a conclusion to the passage or to the letter, even though he still has three, uh, two more chapters to go. But he's, get, he's, he's changing his subject. He's talking more about the reasons we have concern to be aware. Be, he says, beware, beware, beware. There's things that we have to be afraid of, we, things we have to trust in the Lord because there's many people that want to cause us harm. So here he says in verse 1, he says, Rejoice in the Lord. Rejoice. So we see that the topic of rejoicing in Philippians is a very common one, and almost every other verse has some kind of idea of rejoicing in difficult circumstances. And here later in this verse 1, he says, For me to write the same thing is not tedious, but for you it is safe. So here he is using the benefit of repetition and oftentimes, Apostle Paul repeats things over and over again. And how wonderful it is that 
Apostle Paul repeated to the Philippians, and now thousands of years later we have reference to what he, what he wrote, even though he, he already told them maybe in person, but here he wrote it again so that we can read and benefit from this today. And Apostle Peter also used the same idea. He also was very um, set on repeating and always uh, reminding, stirring up by reminding. So 2 Peter 1.12 says, For this reason I will not be negligent to remind you always of these things, though you know them and are established in the present truth. Yes, I think it is right as long as I am in this tent to stir up by reminding you. So we see Paul and Peter here, he is, they are using the, the method of uh, repetition to encourage the church. So why do Paul and Peter want to remind us? What is so important that Apostle Paul wants to remind us of here? So we see that God wants to raise up Christians whose lives count for his glory so that our life is not going to be wasted in the end. Just like Apostle Paul, we will see he goes through a whole list of things he put his confidence in, and those things were waste. It was absolute rubbish for him because he, at that point, he was trusting completely in those things. And we see here in these verses here in verse 2, Apostle Paul talks about being aware of dogs, evil workers, and the mutilation. So who is he referring to here? There was a sect of Christians called the Judaizers who were Jews, but they accepted Christ, and they, they thought that, they, need, that um, they wanted the Gentiles to obey the law. They wanted them to follow the Sabbath, the circumcision, the food laws, and they, they wanted those Gentiles to obey the law. And Apostle Paul goes back and says that, Christ uh, fulfilled our righteousness is not in the law, but in what Christ did for us. And here he calls the, the, uh, the Jews, Apostle Paul calls them dogs, which is, in our time, maybe when we think of dogs, uh, it might be like a little puppy that you have at home, and you, you, it's a really pleasant animal. But in that time, Apostle Paul uses this really... Um, derogative term to say that these are vicious, uh, rabid dogs that only want to destroy you. He's calling them a really uh, serious name. He's saying they are dogs, they are evildoers because they are causing the young Christians who just believed in Christ to, to go back to the law, which was never fulfilled by them or by their ancestors. So Apostle Paul calls us to a very serious uh, thing. He says, beware, because there's things that we have to be afraid of, things that we have to um, be very uh, cautious of. And if we do not focus our attention on this, then we, we know that there were many that were drawn away and began to follow the law again, the old, old covenant. So here, as we go through this passage, I would like to show three things that relate to this idea here to how to make your life count for Jesus. So number one is, what are the treasures of the wasted life? And we'll look at the treasures of the wasted life. And if we look at verse 4, though I also might have confidence in the flesh, if anyone else thinks he may have confidence in the flesh, I more. I'm, he says, I was circumcised on the eighth day, stock of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, Hebrew of the Hebrews, concerning the law of Pharisee, concerning zeal, persecuting the church, concerning righteousness, blameless. So he lists all his uh, things that he was proud of as a Jew that did not know Christ. He was saying, this is what I live for. This is everything that was important to me. As a non-believing, uh, uh, as, a, as a Jew that did not believe in Christ, that was the only thing that mattered to him. At that time, he was living for this. He was living for his family heritage, for social status, for his biblical knowledge. He lived for religious activities and for a moral lifestyle. These are the five things that he lived for. And we see this, his whole list of seven uh, things that he mentions here. They could be broken down into two categories. One is the things that he inherited, and one is the, the other is the things that he has achieved. And obviously the things he's inherited, it's kind of 
useless to brag in them because he had nothing to do with it. He was, uh, it was his parents that gave him life. It was his parents that caused him to be circumcised. It was, everything was uh, out of his control. So to boast in that is, seems very foolish. But Apostle Paul says at that time, that was the most important thing to him. So let's look at family heritage. He says here that I was of the tribe of Benjamin. We know that the tribe of Benjamin was a very important tribe in Israel. It was one that remained faithful to, to the King David. It stayed in the southern uh, government in Judah. It was faithful. We know that the first king came from uh, Benjamin. He was circumcised on the eighth day. He was not a proselyte. He was not a, a Hellenistic Jew. He was not a Grecian Jew. He was not a Jew that was uh, just uh, brought in by uh, act of circumcision. He was a whole uh, Jew, Jew, Hebrew of the Hebrews, as he calls himself. And then he talks about his social status. Also being of the tribe of Benjamin was a, a prestigious tribe. And we see that in other places he talks about being raised at the feet of Gamaliel. So he was raised in a very prestigious uh, university. He learned from the best. He was studying under the feet of Gamaliel. So he was a very, uh, he had very high social standing. For him that was the most important thing. And then he talks about his biblical knowledge. We see that he was a Pharisee. So we know that before Jesus exposed the Pharisees for being hypocritical and who they were, the people in, in Israel often uh, had really high re regard for the Pharisees because they thought of them as being the most uh, right, religious, the most righteous people because they knew the law, they memorized the whole Torah, they knew they were devoted to the scriptures. So oftentimes we have this negative connotation, but we see that as for Paul, at that moment he, was, he, he cherished that really highly. He was saying, I was a Pharisee. I knew the law. I memorized it. I lived for the law. And then he says, talks about his religious activities. Oftentimes religious activities, we, we do lots of things. We, we go, we sing in choir. We go visit people that are sick. We do other things, but Apostle Paul's religious activities was that he was a persecutor of the Christian church. He wanted to annihilate the church. He wanted to destroy it. He was so confident that he was serving God that he was wanted to destroy the name of Jesus completely. He wanted to destroy anything related to Jesus, and that was his religious activities. And the fifth thing is he says that he had a moral... Uh, moral lifestyle was highly esteemed. Here it says, according righteousness, which is in the law, blameless. He doesn't say that he is sinless, but blameless in the sense that he, all the requirements of the law, all the rituals, all the animal sacrifices, and everything that he had to do as a, as a good Jew, he did. And then he says, all of these things that I once thought were the most important thing, he says, I counted all as loss, a big zero. He says, this is nothing, this is, doesn't count for anything because I was doing it in the flesh. So if we look at verse 3 again, we kind of pass this idea here. Verse 3, Apostle Paul says, for, me, for we are the circumcision who worship God in the Spirit, rejoice in Christ Jesus and have no confidence in the flesh. So then um, we see that he talks about the mutilation, those that purposely cause, um, sometimes we, 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 know, we see if people that they cut their hands or their other parts of their body just to cause scars on them and that, that brings them some kind of pleasure. That's something that I can never understand. But people did that and Apostle Paul uses the same word to say they were the mutilation and then he says, but we as Christians are the true circumcisions because we are, our hearts were cut, uh, uh, circumcised, our hearts were changed. We, God gave us a new heart, a heart that has no confidence in the flesh. And as we looked at these five categories, the family heritage, social status, biblical knowledge, religious activities, moral lifestyle, if we look at these things, what is the most um, 
What is in common in these five things? The thing that is in common in these five things is that they are all good things. These five categories were not bad. Apostle Paul tells us in a sense that it was good things that he did that kept him from God. He thought he was serving God, but he, he was completely uh, serving God in the wrong way because he didn't realize that Jesus came to fulfill the law. As we see in Matthew, he, he says that he, Jesus came to fulfill the law, to, to, not to add something new to the law, but to fulfill it. So Apostle Paul, in a sense, says that sometimes in doing good things, they can actually keep us from knowing God if we do not have the right foundation. If we start off from being confident in our own flesh, then those things that we do in our flesh, they will only cause us from not knowing, uh, not cause us to not know God because they will keep us from God. And Apostle Paul is saying that if saying that you can have all these things in your life and at the end of it, if you trust in these things, God will put above your life. This is a wasted life. So the topic today we're discussing is how to make your life count for God. We see that if Paul was to die in this state and never know Jesus Christ, all these things he put his confidence in, God would have, uh, would have said this is a wasted life. But for, for, for Apostle Paul, when he comes down, to verse 9, he says, and be, and be found not having my own righteousness, which is from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness which is from God by faith. So Apostle Paul says that that's the only thing that can give us uh, the righteousness before God is when we see that only in, in the righteousness of Christ we can have the right standing before God. So if these are the treasures of the wasted life, then what on earth counts? What can we do? What does God want us to do if these things in and of itself, if we do these things to try to gain something before God, we know that this is rubbish. But God wants us to use these things for his glory, and we'll see how that, is, that will take place. We see that God wants us to use our family heritage to bless others, to be a blessing to those around us. He wants us to use our social status, whether we are educated or maybe we are just doing an average work worker. He wants us to use that to glorify him. The knowledge that we have, the biblical knowledge, he doesn't want us to use it to be puffed up, but to, to edify, to, to show others the way to salvation, just like we heard uh, Brother Tim say that the word that came to him and, and how he was talking about we will give account for every word in that situation, how it diffused the whole situation, how do we can use our biblical knowledge to affect others around us. God wants us to use our religious activities to bless others, but as long as we do not put our confidence in the flesh. So the most important question for all of us, whether we are pastors, uh, deacons, or choir directors, or any other kind of uh, activities, maybe just youth leaders, maybe we're just the members of the church, the most important question is, do you know Christ? Not do you do things for God, not do you pray, not did you pray a prayer and... and not do you go to church every Sunday, not do you give money to the church, not anything else, but do you know Christ? Because that is what he says here in verse 8. He says, Yet indeed I also count it all loss for the excellence of the knowledge of Jesus Christ. That's what Apostle Paul lived for, the knowledge of God. So the, the first thing we looked at is the treasures of the wasted life. Let's look at the second point, which is the only treasure of life that counts is Christ. The only treasure in life that counts is Christ. That's the only thing that we should live for. So Christ makes all the difference for the sake of Christ. This is what makes the difference for us. So verse 7 and 8 is where Apostle Paul talks about making your life count. He says, but what things were gained to me, these things I have counted loss 
Yet indeed, I also count all things lost for the excellence of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and have counted them as rubbish, that I may gain Christ. That was the most important thing for Paul, is to gain Christ and to have the knowledge of him. So to be a true Christian in uh, Philippians chapter 3, according to Philippians chapter 3, means to discover that Jesus is the treasure chest, that Jesus is the true treasure that we should strive for and to live for, and that he is the one that gives the joy, like he says in the first verse, rejoice in the Lord always. He says that only in Jesus Christ we can have true joy if we have the right foundation and start not in our flesh but in the finished work of Jesus Christ. So Jesus Christ is the treasure of holy joy that we can only have in him. So Paul reminds us of having this joy. And this is a radically different kind of Christianity that, than that we see oftentimes in many churches. We see that a lot of people are satisfied with just going to church, just doing the basics. But Apostle Paul says for us, for the, the true Christian can only be when he's, he comes to the knowledge of Christ and comes to the understanding that he has nothing that he can bring in his flesh that will ever bring glory to God except faith in Jesus Christ. And we see that Jesus gave this really strict warning. He said, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter into my kingdom of heaven, but one who does the will of the Father who is in heaven. And on that day will... Many will say to me, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name? Did we not cast out demons in your name? Did we not do my, many mighty works in your name? And then we can add here, um, did we not go to church in, in your name? Did we not go to the Bible studies in your name? Did we not live a good moral lifestyle in your name? Did we not have a good reputation in our community in your name? But as long as we are trusting these things, we know that this is going to give us nothing. It's going to be a wasted life. The only thing that counts is Christ. Christ is the only treasure we should strive for. Because all the other treasures are deceptive. And the last point before we finish is that, treasure, that we should treasure Christ above everything this world has to offer. We should treasure Christ above everything this world has to offer. So if you look at verse 9, where he talks about and being found in him, not having my own righteousness, which is from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ Jesus, that's what's most important for us. So we have found something in Christ Jesus worth losing everything else for, because Jesus is the treasure that, remember in Matthew, Matthew 13, 44, where the one man, he goes... Maybe he's uh, digging something up in the field. Maybe he's planting uh, ha to harvest. Maybe he's plan uh, planting the wheat harvest. And as he's digging, he comes up into a, and maybe digs him up a chest where there's lots of money. And he thinks to himself, wow, this is so much gold. This is so much silver. This is so much treasures. But he knows he cannot just take that treasure. He says, I'm going to put... Uh, dig it back up. I'm going to go and sell everything I have and go buy that field because then that field will become his. And that for, uh, it says, for joy over it, he goes and sells everything he has and buys that field. Then that field, he knows that there's that great joy, that great treasure there, and that's the treasure of Jesus Christ. And then the next, one, next example is of the pearl. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant selling, uh, seeking beautiful pearls who when he found one pearl of great price, went and sold all that he, may, that, uh, that he had and bought it. He bought that one pearl. The, all the little pearls that maybe had some value, he says that's nothing compared to the great pearl of great price. So what other things can do So what other things we can add to our own lives uh, in this list here? Apostle Paul makes this list of his own life. He says, uh, 
I think when we look at our own life, we can add other things to our own life and say, is there something in my life that is keeping me from serving God? Am I trusting in any kind, any part of my flesh, in anything that will keep me away from God? And some examples I would like to look at to kind of illustrate this is an example of Job. I think earlier today we heard, we heard this example already, but I'd like to remind us of Job who suffered everything. Uh, he suffered, he lost his family, his inheritance, he lost his whole uh, cattle, he lost everything he had, he lost all his money, he lost his health, but whenever it comes down to it, in, the, in chapter 19 he says these wonderful words, he says, but I know that my Redeemer lives. At the end of his life, Apostle uh, Job, he did not trust in his family heritage, he did not trust in social status, in biblical knowledge, in any kind of activities he could have done, but he trusted that in, Jesus, in God, he trusted that God, is, his Redeemer lives and that he will make things right. And another example is Moses. Moses who could have lived a very comfortable life in Egypt. He could have stayed as a, a prince of Egypt, but he decided to suffer for the sake of Christ, it says in Hebrews. Hebrews eleven twenty six says, he considered the reproach of Christ greater wealth than the treasures of Egypt, for he was looking to the reward. So the wor word that we can even change here is he counted the reproach of Christ greater. But the interesting thing is he's talking about Christ, even though he lived thousands and thousands of years before Christ. So how is he talking about Christ? So Moses believed in the promises of God that God will send the Messiah. He will send Christ. He believed in the Messiah. He was looking forward to the things instead of suffering for the sake of, uh, instead of uh, being confident uh, or comfortable in the lifestyle of the Egyptians, he chose to suffer with the Hebrews so that he can have the reward which would come. But if we look at these two examples, sometimes we might think these are such high examples that we maybe it's, they're unrelatable to us. We might think, well, it's hard to, to get some kind of example out of these two characters. But let's look a little closer. Let's look at a, a man called Epaphroditus who we looked at last time. In the chapter before, it talks about him, how he was a very simple man. He didn't, he didn't do much for the glory of God, except that he gave everything he had for Christ. He even gave up his health. He gave up everything, and he, that was his whole mindset. He wanted his life to count for God. He didn't want to live a life that will, at the end will say, this is a wasted life. He wanted to do everything, not in the flesh, but in the spirit. So whenever it comes to choosing something and Christ, we should always be ready to choose Christ because Christ is the pearl of great price. Christ is the thing that will never be taken away from us. Remember Apostle Paul in this same passage, he says, for me to live is Christ and to die is gain. He says, if I die, I am happy. If I live, I am also happy. Why? Because I have Christ. For him, that was the most important thing because he had the right foundation. He recognized how useless, how that rubbish, that the word that the Apostle Paul uses is actually dung, manure, things that are horrible, things that we shouldn't even think about a lot of times, but that's what he compares it to, all the things, that were, the works of the flesh. He says it is but rubbish. It is nothing that can ever bring us joy. So as we conclude, uh, I wanted us to think about how can we ever have an effect on our community, on those around us, if we hold on to our religion, our family heritage, our biblical knowledge, and our social status above Christ. If we, ever, if we cherish these things above God, above Christ, then we will never have that influence in the community because we will have the wrong foundation. So may God help us to, to start with the understanding that Nothing counts except for Christ, that we should have the knowledge of Jesus Christ.
that we should have the righteousness which is from God through faith. And as we go on this week, let us be a blessing to those around us, and we will pray in conclusion. Amen.